I'm here today to give you a sneak preview of our monitoring report and research wrap up for the monitoring season that's just passed in 2023. Um, and the report is actually going to be out on Monday. So keep your eyes peeled for that. Um, Debbie will be allowing, alerting you all uh, to it. Um, and uh, this is just an opportunity to talk a little bit about what we found um, and some of the next steps um, and a bit more behind, a bit of background into what, what we've done um, with all the data that's been collected. Um, please, um, opportunity for questions at the end, but there's not a massive number of us here, so please, you know, pop a question in the chat, uh, if you that, and also um, we can, uh, you know, if there is something you need clarification on or more, uh, have a have a short question while we're talking, you know, just shout out, put your hand up, okay? So, I will crack on. So. Uh, what we'll talk about today is the, the sort of the what and the why behind our research and the monitoring and the citizen science that we do. We're going to give you uh, uh, some highlights of the numbers that are coming out of the research on our main topics um, and next steps. So for any of you that are less familiar with Tiny Forest, I think that would be a few of you, so I'll be brief on this, is just to highlight again what a tiny forest is. Um, it follows the planting methodology um, established by uh, the late Dr. Kieran Iwaki, who passed away in um, 2022, unfortunately, um, and he'd spent his whole career working on the concept of potential natural vegetation, so what grows in an area um, when there's been no human intervention. And in Japan, um, where there was high population density, he found very few areas that were undisturbed by human intervention. Um, and the way he did find this was around um, shrine forests, Shinjo Nomori forests, where he found um, examples of pristine forests. And he studied those throughout his career um, and still has students that continue to work on these forests, um, rigorously documenting every step and every, every plant that can be found, the details of how these plants grow together. Um, and so he established a method to develop a fast growing uh, woodland because he was seeking a way to um, protect his country, to protect Japan from natural disasters. Um, and the concept has taken off and uh, travelled across the globe. And our um, uh, example and our um, uh, uh, implementation of the Miyawaki method is in the form of a tiny forest. And tiny forest um, uses the Miyawaki approach, which is the dense planting of trees and shrubs. Um, in our most of our sites, we fit about 600 trees into the area the size of a tennis court. Um, we are approaching it as an urban nature-based solution, specifically fitting it into urban areas where we're trying to um, explore and look at the environmental and social benefits that these forests can provide to these areas, particularly where green space is lacking. Um, and now, after three years, we have a network of 200 living laboratories across the country, which is just so exciting um, to us as, as scientists and as an environmental organisation working with hundreds of volunteers, thousands of volunteers, um, and hundreds of tree keepers who are really invested, like yourselves, in finding out how the forests work, what we can do to, to look after them, and how we can enjoy them. So it's really um, a great pleasure to have this. Um, uh, the data that we have from 2023 is a third year, you know, proper monitoring data collection as our forest subgroup. Uh, and You'll be familiar with the topics that we study through citizen science. Um, we know that we can't measure everything in the forest, um, and we focus topics on uh, uh, areas where we know that there is an environmental challenge in our cities um, and uh, across the world, but, but particular issues that face, face um, urban green spaces. So we look at how the trees are growing and the carbon that's stored in them, we look at um, how the forests and the soil um, can uh, deal with um, uh, flood, in terms of flood mitigation, how they can deal with heavy, heavy, heavy rainfall, which is projected to increase as climate change increases. Um, and we look at biodiversity, which we know is obviously we are facing a biodiversity as well as a climate crisis. Um, and uh, pockets of habitat in our cities are, are vital to uh, uh, maintain the, the biodiversity that we all in, enjoy but also rely on in, in our lives. And finally, um, we look at the, the subject of thermal comfort, which is about um, understanding how the trees cool the air in the cities. Um, 
aside from the environmental benefits, we're also wanting to focus in on, on the social benefits. Um, and we look at how um, people are connected to nature. We look at how our forests can act, can be accessed by a diverse range of people um, and have access, particularly in areas where um, access to high quality green spaces is lacking. Um, and this area of research is definitely still developing, but it's growing in importance in uh, urban uh, green space planning, in um, policy, um, but also in research. And this particular image is of a forest that we've planted in partnership with a uh, addiction rehabilitation centre in uh, Dublin, in Ireland. And um, this was from an event of a suicide awareness uh, at night where people came together to share and to mem remember people that had been lost to, um, to suicide. So it's a beautiful image and a beautiful concept and just shows the power of the forest to connect with people and their, and their lives inside each other. So we're going to uh, run you through now um, some of the key take home messages um, from the report. So, so far, as I said, the report is coming out. That's what the front cover looks like. Some images, hopefully some of you will recognize images that you've um, uh, sent in to Divya and provided. And we've tried to use as many of those as possible um, because we really value you know, how you see the forest and how you, how you take part in it. And, uh, uh, participate and um, forests all, all over the country have been monitored um, and we've had over um, a hundred forests that were actually monitored this year so the map indicates where the red dots are of the forests that were monitored in 2023 um, so we've got a really good spread across the whole country um, with a hundred forests where data was collected um, that involved including, so that's data collected independently by citizen scientists, but also um, by um, uh, through tiny forest events that have been organized by Earthwatch or sometimes by public organizations, science days, maintenance days, and teacher training um, activities. So it's been a, it was a busy summer. Uh, and that, that total up to a, 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 just over, just, just under 2,000 volunteers that attended the citizen science events. So obviously we know many others of you took part in these activities independently of uh, our activities and unfortunately can't, <laughs> can't quantify it. Great. So I'm going to move on to biodiversity. How did tiny forests um, contribute to urban biodiversity? So um, we know that urban green space is crucial for providing homes for wildlife in towns and cities. And we know as I mentioned, the, the biodiversity crisis that we face has been well documented in the UK. The State of Nature Report um, is a national uh, report that comes that's brought together by all the nature conservation agencies and research bodies and institutions in the UK, um, looking at the biodiversity metrics. And it highlights some really serious and troubling ongoing declines. We have not slowed the loss of nature in the UK over the last 30 or 40 years that we've had records. Uh, one particular group that um, is highlighted in the State of Nature report are declines in the distribution, the, how, how many places particular invertebrate groups are found. So they've declined, they're found in 13% fewer places. They've decreased on average by 13% over the, over, uh, since the 1970s. And this is obviously important to us in tiny forests because these are some of the groups that we monitor and the strongest declines in those invertebrate groups were found actually in pollinators, which were found in 18% of fewer places than they would have been in 1970. So bees, hoverflies, and moths, some of the species that we monitor in tiny forests are really in trouble, just highlighting how important some of these habitats are. Um, I just wanted to highlight some of the uh, species photos that uh, that you guys have, have sent in to us. It's just wonderful to see the kind of things that you're, you're spotting. It's not just that they're present in the forest, but people are actually seeing them and uh, the thing about them, which is really exciting. And so they, those were all from flamboyant tiny forest, Neve Hughes um, from flamboyant tiny forest in the, in the West Midlands. Okay. So as you know, we have three particular um, biodiversity surveys. One is on pollinators, one on butterflies, and one on ground dwellers. And um, since uh, um, uh, citizen science, scientists and you guys have all been surveying pollinators and we know that um, uh, we've 
we've started adding we added a question in um this year i think about looking at how many flowers and what proportion of flowers were in the patch where you were monitoring your invertebrates because we wanted to understand you know when it, and it's not rocket science but it's nice to see that when you have more pollinators when you have more flowers in your patch you are seeing pollinators in general it's a statistically significant increase when most of the patch is full of is, is, is occupied by flowers and the reason for explicit for showing you that and including it in the report is really trying to say it's really important that when you go out to do your biodiversity monitoring for your enjoyment as well to see more things but also to sort of end up to have a, a data that's really useful and consistent for us is to, to really generate good results is that if you can go out during flowering periods in your forest so when the when the dog rose is flowering getting out there and doing these surveys then is even more valuable than doing them at other, other times of year. So um, just to encourage in that way. In terms of the main results, uh, pollinator surveys were done in 59 of the tiny forests and 171 surveys, which makes up uh, 1,710 mindful minutes uh, spent watching and gazing at the little creatures that we that we see. And um, what it uh, what the results show us is that flies and other small insects were the most abundant. They made up forty percent of all the insects that were counted, and there were three thousand individual, well over three thousand individual pollinators that were counted through these surveys in twenty twenty three. And forty percent of those were other flies and small insects. And this is interesting because it's actually consistent with the results from the National Pollinator Monitoring Scheme, which for which we use the same methods for. They found a similar um, importance of these small insects, and they were. It was an interesting point that they made. I want to share with you that we think of, you know, pollinators in terms of bees and butterflies and, and sort of the more charismatic species, but actually the role that some of these tiny things play when compared to to, to the, the species we automatically think about is obviously really really important and relatively um, relatively a, potentially a larger. Um, impact on pollination so um, yeah not to not to neglect the uh, the small and less charismatic species the uh, graph on the left here shows that the number of growing seeds so that's how old the forest is essentially so we have forests now that are one year old two year old and three years old and you can see that over the period of, of growth from one year to three years we are seeing that the number of pollinated groups that are seen uh, in each survey on average remains relatively stable which is, which is good because I think a lot of people we, we didn't know if in the first few years after the sort of canopy starts to close a bit whether actually the pollinator um, uh, numbers might reduce um, because it's a different type of habitat and many pollinators are associated traditionally with more open or grassy um, flower habitats but trees actually provide a really important nectar source particularly in the year so it'd be very interesting to see as the as the years um, progress whether this remains stable or potentially even increased. So, um, next we've got butterflies. Um, hopefully everyone enjoyed doing their butterfly surveys. We do look at species for butterflies because we find them, they are easier than some other species to identify, but there's still lots to learn about identifying them. We found that uh, the, the most common species in uh, tiny forests this year in 2023 was the small white and the large white butterfly. They were recorded in um, just under a quarter of the tiny forests that took part. And while these are a commonly seen species nationally, and many of you are familiar with them, they have seen a decline over the last um, decade in the UK. And so it is still a species, even the, even the more common species, we, we don't want to take for granted um, the importance of the habitats that they, that they require. Um, a range of other species were recorded in small numbers across the forest. So we had... Um, uh, the common blue, green veined white, brimstone, commerce, butterflies, painted label, so in quite in low numbers across many of the forests. So in general, the 38 forests um, where butterfly data was collected from took taking 162 surveys. And here we do see the decline in the third year that was somewhat predicted um, around the pollinator surveys. Um, so it's interesting to see, it'll be interesting to look at how that how the species diversity changes um, between um, second and third year are, are we seeing the species that we do see in the forest in year in the third year 
more of the kind of woodland shaded habitat species, or are we just seeing fewer uh, fewer species altogether? So at the moment, we're looking like we're in the forest in its second year, when it's still quite open habitat. Many of you probably uh, have, a sec have a forest that is in its second year, or have been to one, still quite open, um, still quite a grassy habitat, potentially, um, meaning it's pretty, um, uh, you know, appropriate for, for butterflies. So this is not a surprising result. Um, Divya, you've got a hand. Uh, there's a question from Ian. So he's asking, is it also weather dependent? Uh, the decrease in the... Yeah, so there are all sorts of factors that affect how many butterflies you see on any given day. Because we collect, um, but the butterfly data here is, is amalgamated from across all the sites, it is unlikely that every forest, every th three-year-old forest was surveyed on a day when it was bad conditions. It's unlikely, but there is obviously a chance the weather could have impacted it, and more detailed analysis will indicate the weather conditions on any given um, survey day will have impacted on whether species were um, particularly active or not. Um, what we are really keen to understand is because we, we, we encourage people to do surveys of butterflies at any time of the year, but lots of butterflies fly have a particular flight period. So where that varies across the year, if we happen to have lots of surveys, um, undertaken in a time of year where quite a lot of the species actually aren't flying or aren't active, then obviously that will influence things, which is why our um, biodiversity week, or now tiny forest wildlife count week in May, is really important to get as many surveys done in that week as possible, obviously weather permitting, um, because then we have a consistent window within which butterflies would be more active. Does that help? Um, I'll just go briefly on to ground birds, because here, obviously, we do surveys of vertebrates in under the tiles, but you've also reported all sorts of uh, other creatures that you've found under under the tiles, including these uh, juvenile newts, which were found in the Papua Guinea, Papua New Guinea tiny forest in Stafford by Andy Gibson. Um, we had newts reported from a few other forests, I think, that we didn't wait, and frogs, and toads, and mice, and... Um, not photos of all of these things, but uh, um, just really, really wonderful. And we're, we're looking at ways we can capture um, these other species records as well, um, uh, more systematically. But please do keep reporting them when you find interesting things in your forest. Um, but this is where we are beginning to see um, a really nice pattern as, as the forests get older, significantly um, more different groups that are being found. Our diversity is increasing in our forest as the tiny forests grow, which is really, really nice to see. And one of the one of the things we, we predicted, we hoped, and hypothesized would happen. Everyone loves doing the biodiversity tiles, 84 forests, 560 tiles have been lifted. Um, and uh, it's yeah, it's just a it's just a great uh, opportunity to explore what goes on unseen in, in our forests. Just checking. So in in the main, uh, ants made up seventy two percent of invertebrates counted. They still make up a high proportion of the of the invertebrates that we see, particularly in 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 our early forests. But when they ants are excluded from the data, then uh, wood lice, snails, and slugs make up the the, the remaining fifty percent. Divya. Uh, yes, yeah, so there's a question about what's the best way to place the stone slabs back down because, yeah, uh, Catherine says she's afraid that she hurt the creatures. They're, they are amazingly robust. They squiggle and weave their way into very tiny um, gaps and, and holes under the tiles. You'll see, and often you can see the, the sort of tunnels that they've left. So um, I would just do it very gently and carefully um, and try to put it back exactly where it was lifted from because obviously then their holes and tunnels are still, you know, sometimes you can see on the underside of the tile the ridges of the soil, stones are stuck, so you can see where, where they are. Thank you, good question. Right, I will hand over to Sophie if she is with Hope. Hopefully, can you hear me? At the moment. 
we have sound. Let, let's progress with that. Um, I didn't get a chance to introduce myself, so very quickly, I'm the research manager in Tiny Forest. I work alongside Daniel and Claire Har uh, Narraway, if any of you have met her. I know some people on the school will have done. Um, and historically, I'm a plant scientist. So I'm particularly interested in, obviously, how the trees are affecting ecosystem services. Um, so what we're going to look at here is how tiny forests um, grow and how they're storing carbon. So first of all, I think it's probably quite useful to briefly talk you through what a carbon cycle, how carbon gets stored within tiny forests. So this particular carbon cycle that you can see on the left, it refers to how carbon is drawn down from the atmosphere and into the living biomass of trees and into soils and how that can also be released. That's why it's a cycle. So primarily, um, the sun is incredibly important. Um, plants use CO2 from the air and solar energy to conduct photosynthesis in the leaves. And the whole purpose of photosynthesis within plants is to form carbohydrates, which plants then use for building themselves up, growing, and that is why it's then stored as living tissue. So we refer to that as above ground biomass. It also includes roots, um, but that's why we, we, we say carbon is stored here because it is stored in the form of carbohydrates in living tissue. Um, so that's primarily within the Pioneer Forest Project. That's what we're measuring. We're measuring above ground biomass. So tree trunk um, width and height. And then we calculate approximate sort of size and volume of the tree from above that. But plants do actually store um, carbohydrates that's been fixed from the atmosphere underground as well. It does this in its roots and tree roots can be really big. Um, but they also exude carbohydrates, um, which are known as root exudates, into the soil for various purposes. Um, so this can actually then be stored in the soil. And that is also then a whole other cycle that happens in the soil that involves complex things around, uh, you know, soil microorganisms and fungi. Um, and as plants die, the living part and the living biomass can also get fixed in soil through sort of um, decomposing plant matter. It can get maintain their soil organic carbon, it can also be released depending on what's happening in the soil as CO2 back into the atmosphere as it's decomposing. And that's primarily through sort of temperature, heat can do that and break things down, but mostly it's soil organisms munching away on, on detritus. So that's how carbon is stored within uh, above and below ground within our tiny forests. So the tiny forests that were measured for the uh, tree measurements and I was then looking at tree measurements, but also how they're storing carbon over this past year was 123 tiny forests with over 6,000 surveys, which is a huge amount. And our top three common species measured in the last year were the silver birch. We do get quite a lot of those in our tiny forests and they're quite easy to access. And then both uh, the English and the sessile oak at sort of five, nearly 600 and nearly 500. And just to have some quick facts about our, uh, our tiny forest um, metrics. So our oldest forest is Titchwood in Whitney. Um, and it's estimated to be storing sort of nearly 950 kilograms of above ground carbon, which is quite a lot. But the method that we use, bearing just bear these numbers in mind that the method that we use, um, that I'll show you, talk to you about in a minute, it's actually known to underestimate. So the real number is actually likely to be potentially another 50% more, according to sort of scientific research around that area. And our largest tree was found also at Titchwood Whitney. Um, this has an above ground biomass of approximately nine kilos and was nearly four meters tall. And the thickest stem is an older and uh, that's at Pencoidra. I think Daniel might correct me on my Welsh there. <laughs> Coidra Park, so Coid back in Barry. And that is the thickest stem of wow, nearly 50 millimetres. That's really quite wide. So five, five centimetres, good, good chunky stem. And the tallest tree overall measured um, was at Titchwood Whitney again in Oxford. And that's 6.5 metres. I think they must have had a tape measure on a stick to estimate that height. So the way that we calculate the carbon in our tiny forest, I sort of mentioned, we use this calculation. That calculation is known as an allometric calculation. That's just a fancy word. 
meaning that you take width and height and you estimate volume, basically. You can refer, you can do geometric calculations on humans, trees, all sorts of things. Um, and it basically, we know from forestry research, obviously we don't want to chop down trees and sort of burn them. That's the accurate way of finding out how much carbon is there. We need a non-destructive measurement. We know from forest research, this gives an approximate uh, amount of carbon within a tree. So the way that we do this within tiny forests is we initially calculate the green weight from the measurements that you've given us. So we use a mathematical constant. We multiply that by the tree height that you have measured and then by the diameter squared that you have measured. And that gives us an approximate weight of the tree with the water present. We now we know from research that about half the weight of a tree is actually water. So we just take the green weight and we times it by 0 0.5, which halves it essentially. And then from this step, we can then calculate carbon. So again, from forestry research, we know that about half the weight of uh, half of the dry weight is actually carbon. So you just take that dry weight, half it, and we have an approximation in kilos of how much carbon is in that tree. It's a very simple calculation, very easy to do. And when we scale that up to overall to a tiny forest, we take the average um, of all the trees that we measured, we measure them all and then average it by the number that have been measured. And then we times it by 600 to, to represent the total carbon as an estimation that's stored within that tiny forest. That's the method we're using at the moment. We will next year do it a little bit more accurately and start um, looking at species specific calculations. But for now, our estimates are showing that we estimate there's approximately nearly about four and a half tons of carbon stored across all of our 212 tiny forests. And as I said, our oldest site, Whitney, stores approximately 950 kilograms of carbon. Again, bear in mind, it's actually likely that these metrics are much larger and we're looking into research collaborations as better ways that we can uh, explore carbon sequestered within our tiny forests because these are measurements are calculated on um, conventional uh, forestry sites that don't look like our Miyawaki sites. Our Miyawaki sites are quite different. So we're using calculations that <laughs> make it for purpose and nobody's um, ever done this before in Miyawaki sites. So we will in time need to work out whether actually this uh, calculation is, is valid for what we're doing. So looking at our research ambition, our research ambition within tiny forests is that we want to understand how the tree growth within tiny forests and the carbon that it stores varies across the network annually. So how is that changing year on year? And how is that associated to um, the tree species that are present and the forest layers within that? Because we have these four canopy layers within a tiny forest. Um, not there's not very much research out there understanding and uh, sort of documenting how forests change and grow over time and especially not in regards to Miyawaki forest so that's what we're hoping to understand through your really important um, data that you've collected so what we've seen so far as a snapshot is that we see a 13 fold increase in the mean carbon content between years one and three so that's the number of growth seasons so in the first growth season you know the trees are just getting started and we're what we're seeing is that really it's in the third year and onwards that the growth is really kicking up a notch and what we're also finding is where that the trees that are growing um significantly differ based on uh, their canopy layer so um the sub canopy layer significantly differs so we have been doing st statistical testing on this um, from between the shrub and the understory. So the sub canopy grows a lot faster, essentially, um, compared to the other forest layers. And we think that's because the sub canopy can, is, uh, has our birch and pioneer species present. They're known for really growing very fast initially. That's why they're called pioneer species. Um, and the great thing about that is pioneer species also act as nurse species, and that's do what they say on the tin. They grow fast and they actually allocate resources to other trees around them. So hopefully this really rapid growth of our pioneer species in the sub canopy layer means that when the slower growing species start catching up, um, they'll be really healthy. 
Divya, you've got a hand up. There's a question in chat about, yeah. uh, is there an equivalent measurement of traditional planted sites to be able to compare for the extra expected benefits of pine forest over time? Yeah, fa fantastic question. Um, Daniel might touch on this later, but we actually have a dedicated research site through the Miyawaki Research Network. So that's a big question and that one we're trying to address it is how do Miyawaki sites compare to conventional planting because they are quite different. Um, we have a site in the Peak District where we have uh, three tiny forests joined together, essentially 600 square meters rather than 200. And this is flanked by conventional planting. They're using the same tree species, um, same sort of levels of abundance, but we're comparing the two directly. Um, and we've already seen this year that the Miyawaki trees are growing faster with about the same stem width. So um, it's a great question and it's something that we're very interested in. And, and it is, as Hopi said, lots of the, the data that's used to estimate carbon in, in forest is based on, on established mature woodland. There is a lack of data at the stage that we are trying to estimate it from Miwaki at the moment. There isn't a comparable, there is, there is very little comparable data from conventional woodlands, but we're working on those partnerships to see if there's any out there um, and other opportunities to you know, potentially ask, uh, you know, get some data collected by volunteers from, uh, you know, nearby local um, uh, other, other types of planting. But yeah, it's a, it's a bit of a holy ground, keeping on working. Yeah, it's, it's really what well, I've been. We also get sometimes micro internship students from Oxford University. And my last micro internship student was looking at, because there are mathematical models around carbon sequestration in forests. But again, it's all being kind of formed around the principle of conventional planting. So no, no soil preparation and um, wide spaces between trees. And we are now looking at trying if we can work with other researchers or do some work ourselves to try and develop near wacky specific carbon sequestration ration modeling. Um, so it's been very, we are, we are thinking about these things, just to reassure you. <laughs> Conscious of the time, we should probably crack on so to rush through something. Um, yeah, so as the, one of the things that I mentioned there about, again, the sig significant difference between conventional to Miyawaki is the soil preparation method. So we excavate down to a metre. Some people find it very invasive. Um, but what we've been able to show this year is actually it makes a significant difference to the tree height when excavated. So this is one of our uh, sites at uh, Moor Lane in Spain. One side is excavated to 30 centimetres, um, sorry, rotivated and the other side is excavated down to a metre. Everything else is controlled, and we are seeing a highly significant difference in tree height. So up to, I think it's about 33% taller in our um, speed, if uh, in our excavated site, but it's not just the height, they are very vegetatively dense. And there'll be some pictures of that later. later. So, so Daniel's um, part of Daniel's recording thing is blocking my view. <laughs> so how do tiny forests um, affect flood management compared to surrounding areas? So this is a wonderful infographic that you'll find in the monitoring report. And it basically shows the different ways that we're anticipating tiny forests will improve uh, water infiltration in cities. So on the right hand side of that kind of cube, you've got what is probably your normal um, area, for example, in, a, in an amino sea grassland or football pitch. The soil is quite compacted and you get a lot of water runoff. On the left is a sort of miniature image of what we imagine our tiny forests to, to look like and what they're doing. So it reduces the soil compaction through our excavation method, but also through root growth. Um, we create, and this creates channels and pores in the soil as the roots grow and as we get lots of lovely bugs in the soil, they're all bracing up, they're known as soil ecosystem engineers. And this basically creates pore space in the soil that allows roots to grow and it also allows water to infiltrate into the soils faster. And, and also through the presence of the tiny forest, it increases organic matter, so this detritus that's falling to the floor, and this creates hum humus. Um, breaks up the soil more, increases the soil health and increases soil nutrient. It's all a great big cycle of loveliness that basically means that the forest flourishes, the soil flourishes, water infiltrates better. 
So we have this year measured 70 tiny forests, um, which is 122 surveys and approximately we estimate 572 hours of research time. So, you know, it really does show that like every little you do builds up. So our research question and long-term ambition around tiny forests and flood management in cities is um, what potential does tiny forests have to store water through changing to soil quality over time through those processes that I've mentioned and that improves in permeability as the forests grow and how does that compare to the soils outside of it for example on the football pitch nearby. So this image is quite a lot. Have a look at it in more detail when you get the monitoring report. But essentially the take home message from this image is different soil types um, affect infiltration rate. So clay soils, they're very fine. And that means it's harder for water to infiltrate because there's less space between the particles. That's why clay is this kind of claggy because it's actually really small. Um, and the bottom left end, you have sand. That's your biggest soil particles. And, and water runs through sand really quickly, as anybody will know that tries to build a moat on the beach. Um, so our most common soils that have been monitored by citizen scientists were 16% clay loam, 12% clay and 13% uh, sandy loam. And what we'd expect to see is like a faster infiltration rate in something like sandy loam compared to clay, which is what we saw. And we have one of the things we mentioned here is sort of this thing about idea about pore space. So compaction really significantly inf impacts infiltration. We've seen this in the statistical testing within our tiny forests. Um, and as you see here, our soil compaction is 39% lower inside our tiny forest compared to outside. So the average compaction was 1.66 kilos per centimeter cubed versus 2.31 outside a tiny forest. So that imagine how that much is that it's going to affect how fast water infiltrates quite a lot. Yeah, and as you can see, infiltration is faster, funnily enough, in tiny forests where we have less compacted soil. Um, so we have 24% faster infiltration rate inside a tiny forest compared to outside. And what we're finding is that is holding true over the years as they're growing. Initially, we were a little concerned it might just be an artifact of the soil preparation because we've mixed the soil up. Um, it's much faster, but we're finding that it's holding true as the tiny forests are growing. And in, some, in a lot of our sites, we're finding that actually the infiltration rate is getting faster as the forests are getting older. So 65% um, faster inside the tiny forest, for example, in a forest with three growth seasons as opposed to one. And again, when looking at an example, Tiny Forest Spotlight, uh, Hammersmith Park um, shows this. So outside the Tiny Forest, the infiltration rate hasn't really changed from the first monitoring season in 2021 compared to last year. Whereas inside the Tiny Forest, you can see that huge difference in infiltration rate. You know, 2021, I don't have a number of like how many, what the fold change on that, but you know, you're know, you going from 150 seconds down to probably about 10, to 20 seconds um, in 2023. So it won't be the case in all forests. Um, you know, there are things that affect this, but what we're seeing is that at the moment, tiny forests is improving infiltration rate. But for, in re relevance to your survey, um, what is worth noting is that we see it finding that the infiltration rate is affected how by how saturated the soil is when you're coming to monitor. So if you look on the graph on the let your left that shows infiltration rates with what's called box plots. The box is more or less, it's lower, but it's got this quite big tail. And that tail is because if you're coming to uh, do a infiltration test on the soil and it's already wet, the water will infiltrate much slower. So this is something we found this year that it significantly affects um, the infiltration metrics and the measurements that you're taking. And we're gonna account for that in future in the methods. And finally, thermal comfort. What we would like to understand with this is how tiny forests are cool, if they are cooling the urban areas around them. Um, do local microclimate conditions differ within the tiny forest compared to the urban areas of, of grey infrastructure? So buildings, and do they perceive it, do they feel it? So we've got a wonderful picture here of Divya with me earlier in the year, deep in a Wolverhampton tiny forest. And this is an infrared picture of a tiny forest in the Netherlands where you can see that the surrounding grassland and buildings are much warmer. 
So how so cities are predicted to be 10 percent, 10 degrees hotter in future under climate conditions due to something called the urban heat island effect. It's what you can see here is lack of greenery. It's grey infrastructure built pulling in heat. Um, but help, trees help mitigate this by providing shading and releasing water from their leaves, which is called transpiration. And some research conducted by Schwab et al. showed that UK cities um, can trees can contribute to cooling in UK cities by 11 degrees, which is massive. So there really is opportunities um, for us to see this here. And we this year we've measured in 59 tiny forests and conducted nearly 600 surveys, which is wonderful. And we actually have here are showing you the SPEEN. So this is a site that I said we have two different soil preparation methods because we also found here a very significant effect for thermal comfort. So the left hand image is a little hard to see, but it's much lusher um, and it's actually much bigger. Whereas the right hand image is is the side that's been rotivated. So the trees are smaller, they're not quite as bushy, they haven't got canopy. So just to give you an idea, and also thinking back to that carbon. And what we found in Spain is that in the um, excavated forest, so the one with the bigger tree canopy, um, versus inside versus outside, which, which is the lighter colored green graph for temperature, it's actually six degrees um, cooler inside the tiny forest than it is outside. So that's significantly different. So you were six degrees cooler inside the tiny forest compared to the outside grassland around it and vice versa for humidity. So humidity is very important for cooling. Higher humidity usually means you're feeling a kind of cooler evap evaporative effect. And we're finding a much bigger difference, 13% difference of humidity inside the tiny forest compared to outside. So those two things combined means it's just much, much cooler. And that's uh, it's really nice. It's our first site where we're seeing a real effect here. Thanks, Sophie. I'm very conscious of time. So what I'm going to do is be a little bit briefer. But um, with our social research, we are still building this up. And I just want to take the opportunity to urge you where you can um, to, to look into this and look into the social um, impact survey that we have on the portal. There's lots of research around. Uh, and our interest is about the social reach of our tiny forests, so understanding the diversity of people that we can, um, you know, engage and and can access using our our tiny forests. But also, how does taking part in tiny forest activities actually improve people's connection to nature? Connection to nature is understood to have all sorts of benefits in terms of well-being and health, but also in terms of people's understanding of environmental and care for the environment. Um, and some of the ways, the pathways to nature connection I've, I've highlighted here. And we are really interested to understand how citizen science and taking part in monitoring activities in the forest play a role in this. And how can we do this best to ensure we are optimising people's and growing people's connection to nature? Um, and you can imagine yourself the ways in which these particular pathways might have a role for you. What, what's important for you in the, in, in the forest and why are you involved? Um, in terms of so that's a, that's a plug towards doing the social impact survey um, uh, over time um, but then the map that we show in the report um, is uh, trying to uh, illustrate uh, more about the diversity um, and the equity of access to green space that Tatani Forest is trying to address so we use a metric called the index of multiple deprivation which takes into account all sorts of factors including um, the socioeconomic status um, as well as um, environmental conditions. Um, and we found that um, across all of our tiny forests, um, uh, over half of them are accessible to people that are in the 40% the, the most deprived areas of the country. Um, and the government has a target towards everyone having access to green space within a 15 minute walk of home. So that's the, that's the area we, we considered around each of our tiny forests. Um, so it's sort of 800 meter buffer area of each forest. So um, this is all, you know, really important for communicating with uh, landowners and with councils and with policymakers and with funders to demonstrate why, where we should be implementing uh, 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 um, tiny forest and other green infrastructure um, uh, interventions. Right, I'm going to throw you over to Divian, who's going to talk to you about the Please. Yeah, I'll keep it very short. So this was from the Tree Cooper Party from uh, last year. So we had one in during the National Tree Week. We had one in London and another in Haringey. We were sharing 
lunch and we had an amazing time talking to each other. Uh, we also managed to collect some of the data uh, from the tree keepers, you know, voices and feedback. And that kind of reflected what uh, Daniel has been spoke, uh, speaking about with the, you know, the social yes. survey. Uh, because again, having positive impact on nature seemed to be one of the more, uh, you know, motivating factor for most of our tree keepers with also increased connection with nature being second one. Oh, thanks. Uh, yeah, we had few of you guys here at the party as well. So. And we have also the dates uh, booked in for this year. So it's, uh, they're both going to be in November, I think 23rd and the 30th of November. So yes, hopefully we'll make it bigger and more fun. Uh, and also uh, with the monitoring report, we are providing another list where you can still continue to give anonymized feedback uh, about what you guys think and the ones who did not participate in these surveys can still make your voices heard. So. Um, yeah, I'll be providing that link in the report. And the next slide, we have a lot of tiny forest stories covered in the monitoring report this time. So yeah, please do have a look at all the lovely things that your fellow tree keepers have been doing. And if there are stories that we have missed out on, please do let them come and uh, we'll make sure that we highlight them in our next report. And we also have a section in the website where we can feature your stories and, you know, you can be inspiration to so many others and, you know, share ideas of what you have been doing. We have Paul joining us today. So there's Paul and Gus on their tiny tour. We also have Ian, who has been amazing at fixing the fences in the tiny forest. And uh, I know that Caroline has also been featured in the report, who's also joined us. Um, so, yeah, so please do keep the stories coming. And back to Daniel. Thanks very much, uh, Divya. Yeah, I think Sophie and I have touched on the research as, we, as we've as we gone along, the ambitions we have, the collaborations we are building. But just briefly to highlight, we are a research organisation and we're seeking uh, funding for the UK um, Research Council funding. We have a particular bursary at the moment looking at urban green spaces. Um, some of you may have been approached to see if you could join our workshop. Um, and we are putting a proposal in looking at urban green spaces. Um, uh, research, which hopefully will focus tiny coffee. So watch this space for things about flourish. Um, we are continuing to lead the Miwaki Research Network, which grows uh, every month. It feels uh, we have about fifty partners now um, from India all the way to Canada, and we are working on a review paper around um, the benefits and, and the evidence that exists around tiny forests and um, around Miwaki forests. We're also spreading the word in the research um, sector. So Sophie and Claire represented Tiny Forest magnificently at British Ecological Society uh, annual conference here, which is a massive um, uh, international uh, British Ecological Society. People travel from uh, all over the world to come to this conference to talk everything about ecological science applied and theoretical. And it's a really great platform to have Tiny Forest represented. And some of the, some of the graphs and results Sophie shared here were shared at the at the conference um, back in December. Um, so just really showing the the, the the from the from the citizen science data all the way up to, to a site conference how this is um, and they are also due to travel to the European Citizen Science um, Association conference in Vienna, very nice for some, uh, in April this year. So um, watch out on social media for that as well as an opportunity to spread the word about citizen science. Um, so we'll leave you with a few notes of upcoming Get Involved. Um, there are planting days, many forests going in the ground. So if you're anywhere near and want to get your hands dirty again in, a, in, a, in planting another forest, please do. Um, we've highlighted the kind of upcoming monitoring um, sort of seasons, uh, particular focus times, as I mentioned, Biodiversity Week, which is now going to be called Tiny Forest Wildlife Count. Um, but before that, in April, watch out for information about a million acts of science. It's Citizen Science Month. This is a, another international um, uh, uh, initiative. Um, we're taking part in it. Oops, and Tiny Forest is um, featured uh, on their portal as a way of bringing in new people to the Tiny Forest uh, network. You might find some new volunteers come out of the woodwork for it. Um, and we're trying to, as part of that huge project, get a million acts of science completed within April. So please look out for more on that. 
And then finally, the, the, there is a bit of a little call to action, and there's calls to action throughout the report. But specifically, we are working on trialing and improving methods, trying to address some of the challenges that we know that you face, um, and we'll highlight it through your um, feedback, but also through conversation. And, and so if you are interested in taking part in potentially going out into your forest with a group and trialing some new methods with us, get in touch, but also there's opportunities where um, if you're interested in sort of slightly more in-depth uh, research or, or have a particular interest in the project, then please get in touch with us. We are always keen to support um, all our plantings and then the upcoming monitoring for the next season will be on Eventbrite, which hopefully you will be familiar with following. And finally, an enormous thank you. Um, and we maybe have oh, zero minutes for questions, but if anyone wants to stay, I'm very, very happy to stay and answer, answer some. I've got a quick question. Absolutely, go ahead. Can you hear me? Oh. Yep. Um, just if you don't mind, um, I think we're getting a bit carried away with our weeding. <laughs> and when you said about flowers and surveys and that, I was sort of starting to worry that we're getting um, a bit too boisterous. So is it good to leave a lot of the low-lying flowers to help the pollinators and help in the surveys, or is the survey of flowers just on the trees themselves? No, you're very welcome to take part in the survey on uh, uh, on any flowering plant in the forest. So yes, we do quite a lot of the, um, uh, the uh, guidance that Divya provides does indicate. You know, you can you use your judgment as whether you think a plant a weed is um, causing a competitive problem for the trees. Yeah, so we'll just focus really? on the grasses, I think. Grasses, docks, thistles, things that are really overpowering the trees. But even with those, the trees often can can manage reasonably. You just have to, when it gets so out. But yeah. Yeah, um, just focus on around the tree themselves. Yeah, yeah. And um, what, one of the things with the pollinator surveys, um, I am I am keen, and one of the things we've mentioned in the, in the report is to encourage people to do it on the flowering trees possible because then it's a consistent um, tree species that we can start to compare. So uh, hawthorn, which flowers quite early in the season, if we can get out and get as many surveys as possible from hawthorn, then we can look at how that varies across the country with different temperature differences and such like. All right. Thanks very much. Thanks, Kevin. I'm really sorry. I've just seen on all the comments my sound. I do apologise. I didn't. I couldn't look at the comments while I had the presentation up to you. It, it was, I mean, most of the time, I think it was fine. It's just the end that was trailing off. But uh, hopefully it was all right most it of the okay time. It was okay for me. It was fine uh, for me too. <laughs> to vary. Um, well, thank you so much for joining us. And uh, I'll, like, yeah, one day when we release the report, I'll make sure I send another emailer with the link to the report so you can have a look at that and if you have more questions please do reach out to us and as Daniel said if you are interested in doing your research or helping us trial out other research then yeah do get in touch with us. Uh, please yeah. could you send the recording because some of my colleagues couldn't attend. Absolutely so I'll be uploading this on our YouTube channel so I can also share, uh, send the recording link when I send the report across the that fine? On the email yeah thanks. Yeah. I'll do that. Good night, everyone. Bye. Good night. Thanks very Thank much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Yes. Thanks so much. Thanks, Thank Alex. Thanks, everyone. Bye.